when one is actually moving with life, there is that sense of timelessness. You realize, oh yes, that was two weeks ago. Time has gone by. I thought in this hour, to culminate our week together, we might consider something more pertinent to direct service. We're supposed to be masters. In order to be a master, you must be mastered. A master at assisting human beings to have a greater experience of life. Little old winemakers. Now, in order for this to take place in our service, there is a need to understand various things. To be as wise as a serpent and as harmless as a dove. I understand at the beginning of the week, Larry used the illustration of the hub, particularly in relationship to the various disciplines in the healing arts on the various spokes of the hub. I thought we might pick that thread up again in a little different way this morning. How's the hub? Yeah, all those various spots <coughs> emanating from the hub. Now we might say that the hub symbolizes a true state of consciousness. And a true state of consciousness is when the person can say, in truth, I am, and know the truth of that. They might say, I am love, truth, and life. They know who they are. They're revealing the reality of maturity. In their own experience, the creative processes have worked out to the point where their identity has moved from creation, from their capacities of body, mind, and heart, to the point where they're standing identified with that which stands behind their capacities. It's what we call the fourth dimension. They've emerged out of the outer three dimensions, and they're in the fourth dimension. The fourth dimension, as you know, is the connecting dimension between the outer three and the inner three. So they are, in fact, the connecting link in their own consciousness between the invisible and the visible. And in that state, they're standing at that hub with a consciousness of life, in position to offer life to anyone who is open and amenable to that offering. Now, in that service, we find from the hub we find there are individuals along various spokes. There's an individual here on this spoke, and there's one on that spoke, and there's one over there on that spoke, and here's one over here. And they come in various ways. They might be coming possibly through various disciplines in the healing art. And you have a chiropractor over here, and an osteopath here, and a physician there, and a dentist there, whatever. Or it could be they're in various religious patterns. Got a Baptist here, Southern. <laughs> you got a Northern Baptist here. Uh, actually, I think they're further apart. <laughs> we have a Catholic. In our recent tour of India, we found ourselves working with all kinds of different spokes in the religious pattern there. We spoke in the Sikh pattern, the Hindu pattern, the Muslim pattern, and in the Christian pattern, too. They're Got a spoke over there, too. A little wobbly, but it's there. But it's all, those are all spokes. The person usually has been hung up in the spoke. Most of these spokes that uh, are present on Earth, actually, rather than being a spoke which would allow one to come to the hub, most of them 
are prisoned. They incarcerate the person, or try to anyway. They can't, in fact, if the person's really moving, because you will move out of that particular incarceration. You found that, I'm sure, in your own experience. There are various things you were probably identify with one time, uh, but as the as the creative process continued, you continued with it. You find yourself you found yourself moving out of it, leaving that behind. It was fine, right? but you didn't get hung up there. And you kept going, you kept moving, so that your movement was towards the hub. <coughs> now, movement towards the hub is consequent upon a person's response. There is a very definite quality to the hub. I suppose, and using the words in the Bible, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, with all thy soul. I suppose we could put the word hub there. <laughs> Thou shalt love the hub. Because <laughs> the hub has a very definite nature. When we say the hub of the Lord, there's a very de definite nature to it. Right? Very, very specific qualities. And a person who's, who's, who's properly responding to the hub, moving towards the consciousness of, of being centered in the hub, they're expressing these qualities. Joy, forgiveness, peace, patience, assurance. These are all hub qualities. And in a person's response towards that, these qualities are increasingly expressed. And as they are expressed, the person finds themselves moving towards that point. But I'll clue you. No one can come to that hub without some help. <laughs> we all need some help. Right? I suppose we could use the word intercessor. We need someone to intercede for us. And when I use the word intercessor, I'm not thinking of someone else doing the job for us. <laughs> you need someone else to assist you in a, in in in, in understanding as to what it is that's required to stay with the creative process. Right? And that person, of course, just can't be mouthing words to you, and even the words they're mouthing may be accurate words. But unless that person's speaking from the hub, well, the words are kind of like a tinkling cymbal, as we were speaking about last night. There isn't the authority or the force behind them so that they penetrate into the subconscious mind of the person. But that help is necessary. And uh, this is what we've been providing here this week. <laughs> Direction, so that one could see what's required. In the break that you were just on, I was speaking to a young lady. She said the puzzle's coming together. That's right. Because when it comes together, you realize you've been the puzzle. <laughs> huh? That's been the problem. But your mind is more and more understanding what it is that's required. Now, in the hub, this is where true service can be offered. Now, that doesn't mean along the spoke we can't offer help. As I look back at my own experience, and I'm sure you can look back at yours, I think we were pretty dangerous along the way. <laughs> <laughs> things that we did. I, and, uh, I think that the reason why things worked out is because we were absolutely sincere about it. You know, you can be sincerely wrong. <laughs> so, but, but because of our desire to assist another, even though our understanding was quite limited, but because of that, the, the right motivation, it was a motivation of service, even though there were limitations in our understanding, it did prove to be a blessing most of the time. So in the hub, we need to be in order to serve. When a person is moving along the spokes, they can help a person. Say, so here's someone coming along here, and they can bring them up to here. And the therapist can only bring the person to the point where they're at, that's all. Right? Or here's someone, say, up here, and they assist this person to come up here. Right? But there are very definite limitations as long as our consciousness is on the, is on the spoke. Right? You see, we might be able to help someone along a spoke that we're moving. Or possibly we can help someone on an adjacent spoke. We can probably offer service to this. Okay? But a person, say, who's on this spoke, <coughs> trying to offer service to a person on that spoke, it won't work out. Okay? Because the hub is in the way. 
They can't see really what that person needs. Right? Hubs in the way. It's only when the process has worked out in our own experience that we're standing in the hub, that in the hub, we can begin to see, we can begin to see all the spokes. From the hub, we can see the spokes. And here's someone that's on this spoke here, and someone that's on that spoke there. And we can move out from the hub and pick them up. We don't stand in isolated splendor in the hub and say, you come on to me. No, we get on the spoke. We get on the spoke. And our concern is to offer the person what's required at the particular point in consciousness that they're at. Okay? Now, someone who may be, say, along here, okay, they're moving, and they see you leave the hub and serve someone down there, and you do something there, they, they say, well, well, what are you doing there for that person for? Okay? What are you doing there for? Maybe you might even use mud sometimes. Mm -hmm. And if you're not afraid of the tubercle bacillus, you might use spit. <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Those were a couple of techniques that were very successful. <laughs> With someone who had a hub consciousness. Mm -hmm. right? No, we, we pick the person up where they're at. Right? And we serve them here, right, right where they're at. And there's no difficulty leaving the hub to go down the spoke to pick the person up. With the greatest of ease, we move down the spoke and pick it up. It's lots of fun, really. Because if you're functioning from the hub consciousness, you know one thing. You're going to win. You're going to win. Okay? You're going to win. That person is going to lose. <laughs> They're going to lose the identity they have right there. They're going to lose that particular place in consciousness so they can keep moving. Right? So there must be a willingness for the person to lose so that actually they can win. But you have a sense of, of, of confidence. You know that what's required will be fulfilled, which will be absolutely determined by that person's response. Now, this is something that's very important. We need to see where people are at so that we can handle, handle them properly. So much disservice has been offered to people because there have been those who are supposed to have been serving them who sought to give them something that they weren't ready to receive. They weren't ready to, to work with. And the person said, in essence, you will like it. They, they want to force this thing on her. <clears throat> A story about the little Boy Scout that came home to the Scout headquarters. His shirt was all ripped and his tie was askew and his eye was black. And the scoutmaster said, what happened? Well, he's just helping the little old lady across the street. The scoutmaster said, you were, you got like that. Oh, he said, she didn't even want to come. <laughs> that happens frequently, really. Right. A sense of the fitness of things, what it is that this, this particular person can handle. And we need to have the ability to discern that. And we find out as that ability is developed that there's actually only four categories that people are in. Right. Everyone on the face of the earth falls into one of these four categories. Now, we don't have to go around classifying people. <laughs> If we watch them, they'll classify themselves. Right? They'll reveal to you what it, where it is they're at. And no condemnation as to where they're at, but we need to know where they're at. Because if you don't know where a person's at in relationship to what they can receive, particularly, well, you can kind of offer true service. So I brought with me this morning a, a, per a Persian proverb, very pithy. <laughs> And it tells accurately these four states. And I also had some printed up so that you could have one yourself. Right. I'll go over these four states with you. Now remember, this is, this is vital, and you'll find a person along here somewhere, and you'll be in one of these four states. Perhaps you're familiar with this Persian proverb. He who knows not and knows not that he knows not 
is asleep. <clears throat> Let him slumber. He who knows not and knows that he knows not is awakening. Be a light unto his dawn. The third category, he who knows and knows not that he knows is awake. Teach him. Of course, the fourth category, which would describe the hub state of consciousness, he who knows and knows that he knows is a wise man. Pay heed unto his words. Now we look at this first category. He who knows not and knows not that he knows not. This person doesn't know, but they don't know that they don't know. That's one of the worst states to be in. It says here they're asleep. I think they're dead, actually. Okay. Person doesn't know, but they don't know that they don't know. <clears throat> Maybe they have a lot of education. Usually you'll find that sometimes. And they're very proud of their education. But they don't know. And the light shineth in the darkness. And the darkness comprehended it not. They don't understand. They don't know. Nothing can be done with this person. Now, that's one you really need to discern. <laughs> How I've seen those who are seeking to offer service sometime, working with one in this state, putting all kinds of time with them, right? and it's been an absolute waste of time. You talk about blowing the pneumoplasm, uh, dissipating this wonderful substance. That's one of the ways. Trying to offer service. Okay? or what's deemed to be service, when the, when the proper conditions aren't there to allow a creative process to work out. <clears throat> now, that doesn't mean that uh, in this, this type, that doesn't mean we ignore that type. No, we enfold them. But there usually isn't anything very direct. Right? Not much is done. They know not, and they know not that they know not. Then the second type. He who knows not and knows that he knows not is awakening. This person doesn't know, but they know that they don't know. It has been said that saying, I don't know, is the beginning of wisdom. Isn't that wonderful? You don't hear it too much. Okay? But the person who recognizes that they don't know, they don't understand. There's nothing wrong with that. That's perfect. That's the beginning point. I don't know. Good. Now, there's not too much can be done for this person. They know not. They know not that they know not. They don't know, and they are willing to admit that they don't know. That's all that can usually be done for this type of a person is, again, enfoldment. They're asleep. And you know one of the ways to wake a person up when they're sleeping. Turn on the light. Right? Put the shade up. So you ever go into a room and you're trying to shake a person, they still have the shade down? Oh, no. Go ahead, put the shade on. Let some light come in. You'll find a person who begins to <laughs> stir around a little bit. The light. Well, it's your light. It's the expression of, of light, the truth of yourself. This is the light. You don't shine it in your eyes either. It's supposed to be on the path. But you let your light shine. And in the shining of that light, the person who's asleep, they begin to stir in their slumber. It's mostly subconscious anyway. There's something moving subconsciously between your subconscious and the person's subconscious. And that's something to remember, too. Our contact with people, moving from conscious mind, subconscious, our contact with people, is always at the subconscious level. It's from subconscious to subconscious, right? For instance, you're working with a person, something's going on in their subconscious, or vice a, vice a twister, something's going on in your subconscious, and it begins to move into the subconscious of the other. Right? And then it moves up to that person's conscious mind. That same thing works here. It comes into, say, one's own subconscious mind and up into their conscious mind. So this is the way it works. Works this way. Now, one of the problems is that 
with most human beings, there has been this relationship with the things that were wrong in the subconscious mind. Mm -hmm. okay? That's been their basis of a uh, problem. This is why uh, you'll hear a person say, oh, I, I can't stand that person. That's really evident of the fact of what's there in their subconscious mind. Because there's something in this person's subconscious mind that's triggering something in that subconscious mind makes them feel uncomfortable. You know what they say? Can't stand that person. By the way, if there's any person you're around and you can't stand, stay there. <laughs> that's that fellow, whoever it might be, they're delivering a real service to you. <laughs> right? Because they're triggering something in your subconscious mind from their subconscious mind. Probably you. You've never said five words to them. I had seen that. A person, I can't stand that person. I didn't sit down and talk to them. No, I never have. <laughs> but there's an interplay here. Subconscious to subconscious. And, <coughs> and it lifts something up. So if a person is disturbing to you, well, that's good. Right? That shows that you have something in you that they have in them. Right? Now, the thing is, we need to have those right things. In Joe's demonstration, he was showing how the water may go down into the subconscious mind so that that polluted state that's been down there may be clarified. The heart may be purified, subconscious mind restored to be the receptacle that it was created to be. And when it is wholesome, clear, then we begin to have this tremendous ability to work with other people without saying anything at this level here necessarily. Right? Not too much talking, right? But all kinds of stuff going on down here. This is good. Right? This is good. We got an interplay here. Right? We got an interplay here. Now, if our subconscious mind is is clear and it you won't be in the hub unless it is. Only the pure in heart come into the hub. Right? Blessed are the pure in heart, but they come into the hub. <laughs> but if our subconscious mind is clear, then there is this, which is right in our subconscious mind, it begins to have an influence, a very definite influence. And as long as the person stays in our vicinity, and even if they don't stay in our vicinity, right, as long as there is an, uh, this person has a, an open attitude, a good feeling towards this person here who is representing the, the hub, and that interplay is always taking place. This is something. But we've been concerned about this week, those of us in the faculty particularly here, yeah. very concerned with having a, a hookup with you, something right and true, a sense of appreciation towards each other. Oh, that's wonderful. I, I look to establish that myself wherever I go. I love these hookups, right? Because then we have something, we have something, and uh, this is particularly true of a, of a doctor who's working with a patient. The patient comes in, they're in the doctor's office 10 minutes, and the patient leaves out, they're gone. Don't you believe it? Mm -hmm. If you have that consciousness and you're not really serving them, 98% of our work is invisible. <laughs> no, it's 99 and 9 tenths, I think. <laughs> it's invisible. A person comes into, say, one's office, and, and you work with them, and probably you're just with them a short time, but that person has, a, has a, a, an attitude of, of Thankfulness to a Jews or as a, a healer or whatever you are, they leave. Oh, you got them on your wire, right? And consequently, if you're in the hub and you're sending out, you're sending out these influences all the time. By the way, the word influence means in the flow. So you're in the flow. There's something going out, right? And many times that that person you're working with may be under stress, right? It may be a situation that. They're still, they're still hovering down here somewhere, and they're being overwhelmed by this situation. And uh, you've got to contact with them. Okay? So back over the vibratory wire, you send strength, you send blessing, you send courage, you send assurance. And that person, maybe they might even think of you. I sometimes suggest that to a person when I know they're a little wobbly. <laughs> okay? Think of me at that time. I'm in agreement with you now. And this situation may look may look like it's a Goliath. Okay? But in the David consciousness, we can let something into the head of that Goliath that's never entered it before and deal with that particular situation. So these are all connections that work out. 
Now we're into this category of the third. And actually, these are the types that come to seminars. He who knows and knows not that he knows is awake. Teach him. This person knows. But they don't know that they know. And that's the way we come. We come not knowing that we know. And when you hear something that's right and true, you say, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that is the way it is. How do you know? <laughs> <laughs> because you do know. You do know, but you haven't correlated. Yet. You haven't correlated. It needs to be correlated in consciousness. The puzzle needs to have all the pieces if we're going to finish the puzzle. So a person who's moving in this particular classification, one who knows and knows not that they know. There's a humility there, by the way. They're awake and they can be taught. And that knowing may begin to be focused in their conscious mind. So they may move into that fourth category of one who knows and knows that he or she knows. That's a wise person. We need to listen to those people. We need to take advantage of their presence, by the way. As we read history, there have been those on Earth who were in that category, representing the hub, and they haven't been treated very well. Right? They speak of the blood of the prophets. Right? They haven't been treated very well, primarily because there's been such an impurity in the subconscious mind that they couldn't be recognized. Uh, Or those sometimes who have spoken of, of Jesus said, Oh, I'd know him. Mm -hmm. right. I remember at one time on, on television, this very famous gentleman in religious circles, uh, he was asked if Jesus Christ was on earth, how I'd know him. And he said, Oh, by the nail holes in his hands. <laughs> <laughs> no healing, apparently. <clears throat> <laughs> How would we know? They said it takes one to know one. Right? The those who have represented that hub have not been recognized in relationship to Jesus, even those who were around them. <coughs> you read the story and record of it. Asking inane questions and dumb things, right? showing a real limitation of understanding. But here we are today, and you and I have the opportunity of, of representing the hub. But we need to see this very clearly if we're going to serve. And, and as I say, we don't try to classify people. Okay? People reveal themselves. We need to watch. We need to listen. Have you ever noticed that you have two ears and one mouth? <laughs> you know why? <laughs> Because when we're working with people, if we listen and we're alert, and we're concerned with blessing and serving them, they'll give us the door. Mm -hmm. They'll give us the opening as to how we can make the proper approach to begin to bring them along to this particular point here. Now, initially, the person doesn't know how to respond to their true center. They don't know how to do it. And there are those saying, look within. You do, and you're going to get into a lot of trouble, I'll tell you, because when you look within, you look into that mess in your subconscious mind, and that's a harem scare. Right? That isn't the way it's done. Right? The way it's done is external representation. Right? There needs to be the heart represented external to ourselves. And in response to that, right? in response to that, there is response, if it is a true representation, there is a response to the hub. And initially, the person will probably personalize it in relationship to you. That's why many doctors get into trouble with their patients. They personalize the patient's response. Right? Oh, she loves me. Yes, you brute. <laughs> <laughs> the person personalizes the response. Well, that representation needs to be there. 
again, we might see it on this basis and also just see it in relationship to his uh, healer. If they are a true healer, it's because they've got that centering above in life. And here's the, the healy begins to respond. They don't know how to respond to that. Okay? They don't know how to do it. Okay? There needs to be that there represented here at this level here. Hey, let's get it down to earth. <laughs> I had spent the trouble and always kept that up there. People are going to heaven. Well, the last word I've heard from heaven, everything's all right. Yeah. There's comparative peace there. But it's been a mess on earth because we've left it up here. <laughs> we need to get it down here, down at the horizontal level. And here's the, the healer who represents, he or she represents that point. And this person here responding to this is responding to that. That's the only way it can work out. If two of you <laughs> shall agree, then the creative process, then it begins to it begins to work out. I would suggest something here too. As I mentioned, the person at the hub is going to win. Absolutely. Right? They're going to know the victory. Because the victory to them is assisting that person along to the point where they're standing in the hub in consciousness. But you know, the person who's serving from the hub, the cards are stacked, really. Everything's in their favor. Right? Uh, here's the person, we'll say, representing the hub. And you'll note that it's one thing. The person is whole. Right? In the hub, one can say, in truth, the father and I are one. Now, let's get that down to earth now. That seems so mystical. Jesus said the father and I are one. The person is saying, when that's said, in essence, that I am identified with that which I am, which is life. <laughs> life and I are one. Well, that's, that's just a natural state. Everyone is one with the father. Everyone is one with life, but the person just hasn't had the consciousness of it. Now, in the hub, the person has a, a vivid consciousness of the fact that I am that. I am. I am life. That's what I am. They know that. They know, and they know that they know. That's freedom. They're free. Free to express the qualities of life. So here they are in that state of consciousness. And the person they're working with, There's two there. Okay? Roses are red, violets are blue. I'm schizophrenic and so am I. <laughs> There's a Dr. Jekyll and a Mr. Hyde kind of. Okay? Sometimes you'll see Mr. Hyde and sometimes you'll see Dr. Jekyll. You never know just who's going to spring up. Okay? There's, a, there's a pattern of double mindedness. And you'll find this very prevalent. Okay? Have you ever found yourself at peace and at ease? Then you find yourself upset and disturbed? That's Dr. Jacob and Mr. Hyde. Right? In the person in this state, we're the same today, yesterday, and forever. One thing. That quality is always being expressed, regardless of circumstances, regardless of this, regardless of that. There is the revelation of awareness. But when we're working with other people, this is their state. Okay? They speak of the, the little me and the big me. Okay? And the little me is always getting in the way of the big me. And people propagate this nonsense. Okay? They keep that up. Well, it's all right, I suppose, if we're coming along the way here, but if we're really going to move that little me, needs to get out of the way. But in serving, that's the case of those we serve. But we need to remember that if we've found that centering in, in oneness, we're on this morning, was mentioned in the angel. Usually the only time it comes forth is in death, which is a very sad commentary. It needs to come forth while we're living, while we have this facility to express the truth of ourselves. That's life. That's living. So here's one centered in the angel. 
And you know, angels are always in agreement with each other. Did you know that? That's what makes heaven heaven. You know, usually when they picture angels there, flying around in a cloud, plucking a harp. Doesn't that sound great, huh? <laughs> Can't even play the harp. Right? But angels get along with each other. Always get along with each other. There's absolute agreement between angels. And the person you're working with, they're not identified with the angel, which is a creator. They're not identified with their capacities. They're still identified with their body, their mind, in their emotional realm. That's their identity out here. And all, every now and then they, they touch the angel. But here someone comes on the scene, coming out of the hub, down a spoke, picking up this person, still an identity here. There was absolute agreement between the angel that's present in that person and the angel that's now being represented down here, horizontal. A creative cycle is always working out between the angel in expression and the angel that's still being obscured. There's absolute agreement. And look what those two angels got in the squeeze here. <laughs> the pressure's on. Inside and outside. Right? Now, this capacity here with the the person doesn't understand when they're in that identity. They don't understand how to respond to the truth of themselves. It needs to be represented. And when these capacities out here respond to that representation, they're responding to that. No difference. It's one thing. One thing. But a creative process is set up so that when you're working with a person, there may be all kinds of gyrations going on here. The person goes through this and it goes through that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever see a horse trainer? Yeah. They'll stand in the middle of the ring, he's got the rope on the horse, and the horse is running around. <laughs> he just stands there, lets <laughs> him run around, and the horse gets all sweated up. Well, when you're working with people sometimes, still an identity with this unruly ass. <laughs> They're running around. <laughs> now, if you're not in the hub, you'll be running around. <laughs> I had a hot day, sir. <laughs> They're all tucking out. Well, of course. But standing in the hub, as I said, with ease, we move down the spoke to serve. We don't get involved in that. No, it's very easy. We have the time. <laughs> That's a big thing. Person, this identity doesn't have that much time. There is a time period. But we have the time. And we know that this creative process is working out. And as long as these capacities hang in there, they hang in there, baby. As long as they hang in there and they maintain an open heart, an open response to that one that's providing direction. <clears throat> And when it's providing direction, then the process will work out. Because if there's response to this, it's response to the angel, the process will work out where the person begins to be one person. <laughs> and all the many heads begin to disappear. There begins to be one person there. The person finds themselves in the hub. But this is a creative process. You can't hurry it either. I thought that which Ron presented this morning on pneumoplasm was just so beautiful. He touched so many points so quickly. I mean, while we're moving along, you know, we're going to have to waste a lot of time and a lot of thought and all. And we can come right to center, right to the point of thing, right to the nub of the situation, so that we don't waste a lot of time with the extraneous stuff that, that isn't important anyway. But there is a creative process, particularly in the pneumoplasmic pattern. Now, in that first category, which was mentioned in the proverb, one who knows not and knows not that they know not, their pneumoplasm, you might say, is pretty thick. It's opaque. Right? It's opaque. Right? And the degree of our understanding things is consequent upon the state of our pneumoplasm. 
because understanding comes in the pneumoplasm. If, uh, if a person is emotionally upset, by the way, and you try to use logic and reason with them, it uh, doesn't usually work out, does it? Eh? You have to do something to calm them down, probably, and probably a word or two, maybe silence, too. But they can't understand anything in that state because their pneumoplasm is all disturbed. Right? To the degree that they begin to calm down, then they'll begin to understand. Now, initially, what it is, the person's understanding is consequent upon your presence and the pneumoplasmic pattern that you have. And they sometimes in that state will say, well, when I'm with you, I understand. <laughs> and when I'm with you, I understand. Yeah, or, I understood it when I was with you, but when I left you, I, it, it just became a blur again. Because the person didn't have adequate pneumoplasm to allow a true depth of understanding, and they were understanding in your pneumoplasm. This is true in class sometimes. In class, things become very vivid. <laughs> right? But if the person doesn't have enough uh, understanding, then there's kind of a, uh, a vagueness that sometimes comes because they, they don't have the substance to understand. So there are those who have this opaque. The pneumoplasm is opaque. They, they can't see what's behind or in back of the pneumoplasm, which is the truth of the person. They can't see that. As they continue to respond properly, moving along the spoke towards the point of true identity, the pneumoplasm is changing. They're generating the pneumoplasm. They're not dissipating it any longer. There's a finer pneumoplasm. There begins to be a translucency. And now in a translucency, you really can't see what's there, right? It's still a vague thing, right? It isn't absolutely sharp in your consciousness. But the person in that translucency, there begins to be greater light. Now, don't be taken in by this, right? A person will begin to be very uh, uh, delightful, right? Uh, very light and probably very easy and things are going on. And the, there's a translucency, you might say, in the pneumoplasm. The pneumoplasm, which has been an obscuring veil, begins to be translucent. And they, in their own consciousness, they're seeing, they're understanding. I'm saying seeing, I'm not speaking of physical seeing. I'm speaking of uh, mental and emotional understanding. They're beginning to see certain things, but it isn't, it isn't defined yet. And this is a very precarious state. Because sometimes they can jump to concussions <laughs> and think it's this, right? So this is why one needs to stay humble. Stay humble, right? And as we continue in right response, the pneumoplasm is being generated and refined. And there comes a point where there's a transparency so that we begin to accurately, in consciousness, begin to, to see and know and understand what it is that's going on. Now, there are various things that may be offered to a person as they're moving along the way, and these are necessary. Okay? These are necessary. Sometimes a person having the right material in their subconscious mind uh, under a particular stress situation, this right material will come up and remind their conscious mind of a particular thing. I, uh, I was in New York recently. I mentioned this at a a service that I gave at the 100 Mile House last Saturday. And I had never seen New York in the state that it was in. Thousands of cars all over the place. Right? And I was going from an area in New York to Kennedy Airport, which should take 20 minutes, which took me okay, three and a half hours. <laughs> so could, that, that'll explain what, a, what we were working with. Now, all the situation was saying you're not going to get through. And I want to get on that airplane because I knew that you were waiting for me out here too, and I wanted to be here with you and other things too. So I was concerned to get through. And uh, I was with a, a friend of mine who's a very capable fellow in these situations. He's unrelenting. His name is Lou Rotola. <laughs> and he was in agreement with me that we were going to get to that airplane. I, and uh, he was going up on sidewalks and over medians and everything else. and. Uh, there was one situation, there were about 20 cars all over the road in front of us, and we're out, out of the car, pushing this one out of the way, pushing out of the way. <laughs> and we made it. Okay. I got there, and the door of the air can of the plane was closed. And we were getting ready to go, and they opened it for me. Okay. But along the way, 
It's something I had in my subconscious mind. The 91st Psalm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful Psalm. Some of the words in the Psalm is, Thy truth shall be thy shield and buckler. <coughs> and here's a shield. Here's something that offers protection. And when one is moving properly, you may be sure that that protection is there. There is a protection. You're not concerned that you're protected. Mm -hmm. But it's just a natural protection that comes as a result of right response. But also the buckler's there. Okay? And the buckler is the thing that opens the way. And I could see that there was protection. You know, all these cars were <laughs> slipping all around us. But the buckler was there. We were, we were opening the way, clearing the way. We weren't sitting, twirling our thumbs. We were doing a little pushing, as a matter of fact. But the way was being opened. And that's very true. In relationship to our own experience, sometimes a person is wondering, oh, will this work out or will that work out? Well, first of all, we don't get any crystallized concepts as to what should work out. As I emphasized yesterday, we, we, we don't know necessarily what needs to work out, right? Well, we may have some idea, but we don't get too stuck in the idea. But we know one thing, that if we're responding properly, all things do work together to perfection. The buckler is there. The rain will open, right? And if we're, as I say, if that centering is maintained, we may be sure. In some situations, other people looking at us will say, I can't imagine how the way can open. Right? That situation when Moses came to the to the Red Sea, and here he had the Red Sea at his back, and here was Pharaoh's horde coming right down upon him, looked like he didn't have a way out. Okay? And all the responding ones around him were so helpful. <laughs> Complaining, and look at the mess you've got us in now. But he held it steady. He maintained his integrity, and the thing opened. <laughs> it opened, and he was able to cross over, and the thing that was pursuing Blah, 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 blah. They were down in the water. They were swept out of the way. So the way will open. And we need this material in our subconscious mind. This is why this week we were sitting in this class and you were delighted to be here and uh, you were appreciative of what was being offered. And you could see that what was being offered made sense. So that was all put in your filing cabinet, right? That's all stored, cataloged, and indexed in your subconscious mind. And if your attitude in receiving it was right, it was filed properly, right? And under situations and your response is right, that material that's in the subconscious mind, you'll find it. It'll come up, right? It'll come up. And it'll be just the thing that's, that's required under a, a particular situation. So I'm going to just leave you with a key. Okay. And I found this when I was reading a pilot's flight manual. I had a brother who was going to take up flying, and I went into his home one time and was sitting there reading his book. And as I read it, I thought, well, look at this. Okay. It's a student's pilot flight manual put out by the Iowa State University Press. And it's called Problems and emergencies. Okay? And the, 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 the subtitle is Getting Lost. Right. If you encounter a problem, it will be most likely that of getting off course or losing checkpoints. And that's it. The person's moving along and the yaw factor comes in. <laughs> They begin to yaw off. <laughs> they begin to deviate from the true course. Okay? And they need help. Or either someone who's providing direction, they, they, lose their, they lose their contact with this one who's providing direction, the checkpoints. The one who's providing direction is just there saying, good, moving along fine. Yeah. Creative process is working out in your consciousness. If you encounter a problem, that's what it will be most likely that, of getting off course and losing checkpoints. Students and even experienced pilots hmm, sometimes lose checkpoints even while on course. This is particularly true on those parts of the trip 
where checkpoints and spots are visibility somewhat restricted. Being at a low altitude aggravates the problem. <laughs> when this happens, don't start circling or heading off into what you think might be the new right direction. Maintain the compass heading that you were doing okay with earlier and try to identify other checkpoints. Pilots have missed a checkpoint and figured they were lost, but by continuing on their original heading, found they were right on course and checkpoints began to show up again. The Federal Aviation Agency suggests the use of the four <coughs> C's in such a situation. Okay. This is something spiritual. <laughs> Divine direction. Here's the first one. Confess. Admit to yourself that you have a problem and confess it to the nearest ground station. Now, what do you think of that? <laughs> this is a toughie for some people. I recall being in a car with a gentleman one time, and he went around a square about 12 times, I think. He was lost. But do you think he'd stop the car and say, hey, how do I get the such and such? Oh, no. He just kept going around because his human ego was there. Human ego, it said, I couldn't be lost, but he was. <laughs> Eh? He was. So confess. Eh? If we've got problems, or we're off course and confess it to the nearest ground station. That nearest ground station might even know your name. Here's the next one. Climb. Now that's a good... What did I say about it? Altitude enables you to see farther and makes for better communications. <laughs> altitude is determined by attitude. You tell me your attitude, and I'll tell you your altitude. But when you have an attitude which is consistent with the qualities of the hub, well, you, you, because you have that attitude, you begin to have altitude. You begin to see from above because you're identified with the qualities which come from above, from a higher vibratory level, you begin to see and consequently you have altitude because your attitude is consistent with the nature of the hub. And here's the next one. Boy, that's a funny one. Ron was speaking about that last night, wasn't he? Communicate. You have a complex system or emergency aid no farther away than your microphone or television or telephone. Communicate. Stay in communication. Okay? Usually, sometimes people only communicate with you after they've uh, been in trouble, okay? and then they, they, then they cry under the hub <laughs> in their troubles. Okay? No, let's be wise. Let's keep these lines of communication open so that we keep this free flow between us all. And sometimes just a letter sometimes. It's just so vital. Right? Even if it's just in one line, we don't have to go into long detail, but one line just to keep this thing flowing between us. And the fourth one. Comply. Do what you're told by the aiding facilities. <laughs> <laughs> Any doctors want to get this printed up for patients? <laughs> Imagine calling the tower. You're lost. You've confessed. Right? And uh, you've, you're, you're communicating. And the tower gives you a particular heading. And you say to the tower, but I don't want to go that way. <laughs> <laughs> Comply. Do what you're told. 
by the aiding facility. Now, those are the four C's put out by the Federal Aviation Commission. I've added a fifth. There's a fifth C. That's either cruise or crash, <laughs> depending upon how well you follow the first four. Now, that's actually very accurate as to what's required to move through this process where we've been on the spoke to the point where we may be in that category of one who knows and knows that they know. And in that category, we can serve. We can serve anyone anywhere. Okay? And we, we delight. We delight in variety, actually. Right? We delight in, in meeting people in various situations and using our wisdom and our ingenuity to find ways and means to get this person who's stuck, this person who's dying, to get them moving so they may come to the point where they have the experience of life and life more abundantly. So I'm delighted in what time I've been here to share this time with you. I'm very thankful for those who live here in this beautiful place at Edenvale, who day in and day out are providing an atmosphere here, a healing atmosphere, so that we can have something like this. You think if there were, if there were riots going on here in Edenvale, we could have brought this class here? No, no, no. It's because the wonderful ones who live here have been providing this beautiful atmosphere so that we could come in and we could consider these things. Even the, even the things we've considered this week, it couldn't have been done without this wonderful atmosphere and the people here who provide it. So I'm thankful for those, and I'm thankful for these ones that I have the opportunity of serving with, and I'm thankful for you. Mm -hmm. For your desire to, first of all, follow that compulsion that brought you here. You're here in spite of anything your mind may have said. <laughs> you're a jerk here. <laughs> and you've, you let it work out. Right? And it brought you here. So that we may, in oneness, stand in the hub. And we may take this world in which we live and do with it what should be done with it. Let it be a, a place of life place of joy, so that this sad commentary that we we'll see, see on us may finally be resolved, because you and I have a hand in right identity in resolving it. So, God bless you all. Cards. 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 This will offer you many hours of meditation. Amen.